happy baby Friday, everybody. Um, I am uh, running a little bit off kilter this week, so I apologize for that. Um, I appreciate those of y'all that uh, got the notice when I put it up and are uh, able to join me. Uh, I see the lady is, is on with me. Um, so I'm very happy to see that you're back again, lady. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever y'all are calling from. I know ladies out in California. So, uh, so a little bit earlier out there for her. Um, so I've just had, uh, like a week. We are, uh, in Wisconsin right now, uh, up at our, our, our place up here. And, um, uh, we had last week, uh, on one day, we had six tornadoes that, uh, came through here and we had two, one on each side of us very close. So we had a little bit of a scary doing, um, sorry, we had a little bit of a scary doing and it knocked the internet and it knocked, you know, it, it just knocked everything out. And so we have been in, um, kind of recovery mode, uh, for a while. So I didn't get yeah, everything kind of reset up and, and calibrated back again um, uh, for uh, being able to put a notice out. Because usually uh, those of y'all that attend these regularly know I put them out, you know, what, far in advance for everybody to know what's going on. So I apologize for that. But I'm glad to those of y'all that could join me. Um, hi, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, Allison. Good to see you again on here. Oh, you're welcome, lady. Um, so if y'all are new and and I, um, you know, wanted to do this before, but sometimes it slips my mind um, that if you're new to uh, being an attendee here for the broadcast, uh, if you would uh, just type something in and, and let me know that you're new and where you're from so we can kind of give a little recognition to y'all for joining too, that would be good. Um, and lady in Guadalupe, Thank you, um, you know, about that. But yes, everybody, uh, luckily, you know, there were there was some property damage to places, but there wasn't loss of life. So that was really good and unusual with six tornadoes. So um, uh, it was a little bit uh, um, scary for a bit. Our, our dogs were kind of uh, going crazy, but um, everybody made it through and everything was all right. So thanks. So um, today I decided to do a little thing on Mohs micrographic surgery. Um, derma is one of my specialty areas that I, I, I really love. Uh, and, and I love to talk about dermatology. And I think Mohs is the greatest thing ever invented. So I wanted to, to um, do a little thing on Mohs today. And um, I, I got, I have some slides that I'm going to show and they are from um a presentation lady who is, is one of the attendees on that I was doing for their local chapter. And unfortunately we had some, we had some issues keeping uh, connectivity going during the meeting. So I thought it would be, you know, nice for me to just go ahead and do some of it on here and, and kind of show some different things so that um, lady and those ladies that were attending from the chapter, maybe if they could join on here, they could see some of the stuff because they seem to be very interested in it. Uh, and again, I love talking about uh, derm stuff and Mohs. Moses is just really neat. So, and I do have a video for Mohs surgery that I'm going to show um, that we, again, couldn't get to stay up when I was trying to do the presentation for her chapter because it was virtual. So um, uh, hope everybody likes it and, and, and um, is going to like the discussion. So I'm going to pull my slides up now. So we're just going to go through um, some things on Mohs. I want to just talk about like how it was invented. What I like to do when I talk about surgical things, um, if if I can, you know, dig in and do some information, I like to give some uh, broader information so that coders, auditors, um, maybe non-clinical people, you know, that are in the field get a better understanding of, you know, how it came about and um, why the value of those codes are where they are and things like that. I think it helps give a better understanding. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the inventor of Mohs and his name is Frederick Moe. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the procedure of course was named after him. So um, we'll take a look at that. I have an early picture of him uh, and some of the staff that was helping him in bringing about Mohs when they started doing it. So, um, 
with uh, also with with things when I talk about from a surgical standpoint, you know, I, I do like sometimes to talk about the organ systems that are involved in the surgery. And of course, with um, Mohs, you know, it's going to be the skin. Yeah, you know, and um, the skin itself, there's from a CPT standpoint, I like to discuss this because I get a question a lot about um, where does the skin end? You know, because you see a lot of things that will say that there's three layers to the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and some people call it the subdermis or the subcutaneous. And so uh, in a lot of teachings, you see, they'll talk about three layers. And then some, you see them talk about two layers. So it's like, okay, well, if I'm into the sub Q, is that still considered something in the skin or should I be going somewhere else? And so from uh, a CPT standpoint, if you look at the codes in the CPT, uh, CPT considers there to be two layers of skin, the epidermis and the dermis. So when you get into anything lower than that, you know, then you want to be looking into the musculoskeletal system section for things um, with uh, doing different procedures and things like that. So from a CPT standard, skin is the two layers, the epidermis and the dermis. Now, when you look at the little picture that's on the slide there, um, the skin actually is made up of those two layers. And in the epidermis, the epidermis has um, four to five layers in it. So the layer is made up of layers uh, and they say four to five because you have four all over your body, but you have an extra layer in the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And, um, you know, if you are a Darwinist, uh, you know, they believe that, you know, that just, we had some extra padding there. You know, so when we were walking around on all fours, it kind of gave us some extra padding. Uh, but, you know, no. So you have that extra layer there. But um, the layers are either called stratum, um, which is the either Greek or uh, Latin term for layer uh, or layer. So you have the stratum corneum, the stratum lucidum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum spinosum, and the stratum basale, or the corneal layer, the lucid layer, the granular layer, the spinosal layer, and the basal layer. So, you know, you may see it either way. Um, and the stratum basale, the lowest layer, is the one that is at the base of the epidermis and gets the, the feed, the nourishment from the dermal layer, the blood vessels. So the second layer, the thicker one, as you can see in the cutout there, is the dermis. Now, with the epidermis, the epidermis is mostly all dead stuff. You know, there's no blood vessels in there. Um, it has the melanocytes in there, which are the ones that produce the melanin for the dark pigment. Um, so interesting that uh, a little fact here, the difference in people's skin color is not the number of melanocytes, it's the amount of melanin in the melanocytes that, you know, make the uh, different pigmentations in the skin. Uh, but the epidermis is it's the first layer of protection, and it's to protect against water loss, mechanical injury, things like that, and from bugs and different things getting in, bacteria. So um, it's the largest organ system that we have because it covers everything. Um, so the dermis has two layers. Uh, it has the papillary dermis and the reticular dermis. So those, even though it's bigger, there's actually only two layers to it. And as you can see on the picture, that's the one that's got all the kind of working business of the skin in it. So that's where if you look on that, you see that there's sebaceous glands, the erector pili muscle. That's the muscle that when you get the goosebumps, it pulls and it makes your hair stand up on end. So um, that's what that does. Uh, and as you can see, your sweat glands, the hair follicles, things like that. So all of that good, busy stuff goes on down in the dermal layer. Um, and then it connects to the subcutaneous tissue, which is loose connective tissue and adipose tissue, fatty tissue that gives insulation and um, protects the deeper structures and binds the skin to the underlying organs. So that's the... Um, the organ system that we're talking about here. So uh, why we do MOS is, of course, because of skin cancer. So with skin cancer, just, you know, a few um, statistics on skin cancer is that it is the um, uh, most common form of cancer in the United States. 
There are more than a million new cases of skin cancer reported every year. Uh, and it's rising faster than any other type of cancer. So make sure that you are wearing your sunscreen when you go outside and make sure you're not getting those nasty sunburns um, because that can help promote skin cancer. So we want to prevent all that stuff. Um, and it can be found anywhere because you have skin everywhere, but about 80%, most of the skin cancers are located on the sun exposed areas, the face, the head, the neck, you know, um, and so um, the primary cause of it is the UV rays. So um, that's what we are wanting to look for. So um, one of the other things I wanted to show you was something that we see when we're doing Mohs micrographic surgery. Sometimes in your notes, if you look and you see that they're giving an AUC number, that is the appropriate use criteria. This is something that was developed by the American Academy of Dermatology, the American College of Mohs Surgery, the uh, American Society for Derm Surgery, the American Society for Mohs Surgery, you know, they all publish this, what they consider the appropriate use criteria guide for a decision on whether or not Mohs micrographic surgery is supported. And there are a couple different of these criteria out there, but this was the one that was uh, put out by that grouping of the dermatological specialties. So uh, it is used a lot by a lot of providers. So if you see that your most surgeon or in the documentation, they're talking about the AUC number, uh, this is what they mean. And they also have apps. If you want to look it up, there's an app that you can get that is the AUC guide. So you can put in all the information and it will give you the AUC number. So um, what it does is... Um, uh, has a scale on it. So it, it has a scale from um, uh, one to nine and um, it bases it on various, various tumor characteristics, patient characteristics. There's 270 different clinical scenarios that it looks at. So if it comes up with a score of one to three, that will signify that Mose is inappropriate for that patient and generally not considered acceptable. If the AUC score is four to six, that says, you know, they're not sure it's, you know, should be, you know, what the most surgeon feels is, is clinically, you know, medically necessary. And then a score that seven to nine means that Mohs is appropriate and generally considered acceptable for that patient. So um, they say for the scale for any basal cell carcinoma, regardless of the location that Mohs um, uh, should be you know, appropriate um, in, in any of these scenarios, if they've got previously eradicated skin, traumatic scars, osteomyelitis, inflammation, you know, uncertainty, um, patients that have xeroderma, pigmentosum, basal cell, neva syndrome, any kind of um, uh, genetic condition. Um, so uh, also with the Basal cells, if they're recurrent, so recurrent basal cell carcinomas, they consider appropriate. And then they start talking about areas. So sometimes on your um, uh, notes, you will see the appropriate use criteria and you will see areas where they mention area H or area L, you know, that kind of thing. So area H, when they mention it, is the central face, the eyelids, um, the eyebrows, the nose, the lips the chin, the ear, the temples, and the genitalia, hands, feet, nails, ankles, uh, and uh, nipple and areola areas. So those are considered the area H, their high level of probability for uh, Mohs candidate. And they're more uh, vascular in nature. So there's other um, considerations that have to come in use with like repairs and things like that. So if it's an area H, and it has a most score of like seven, you know, that's a good candidate. Um, then you have area L, which is the trunk and extremities, the pretibial surfaces, the hands, the feet, the nails, the ankles um, uh, that they use. And then there's area M in the middle for cheeks, forehead, scalp, neck, jawline, and your pretibial surfaces. So you have high, medium, and low H, M, and L. So they also will sometimes designate areas when they're going to do MOS. Mm -hmm. 
So the other thing I wanted to give y'all was a little bit of things on skin cancer. So as I said, one of the reasons why they do MOSE is for basal cell carcinomas, um, which is the BCCs. And with these, it's the most common of all cancers, even with skin cancer. One of every three new cancers is a skin cancer. So um, most of those are basal cell. So uh, with basal cell, once again, you get the um, the the frequently more on those sun exposed areas, the face, the ears, the neck, scalp, shoulders, back. Um, but you can get them anywhere, as I was saying before. So when you look at here at the pictures, these are just all different basal cell carcinomas. And you see that uh, the warning signs that, that they talk about. I know when you do the ABCDEs, you know, we talk about asymmetrical and uh, color changing and things like that. But when you have the lesions, um, different signs that the lesion could be uh, a basal cell are things like um, uh, if it's an open one that bleeds or oozes um, it, or crusts up and it's there for three or more weeks or it's a persistent non-healing kind of sore. Uh, if it has a reddish patch with irritated areas, usually in the chest and the shoulders and the arms or the legs, uh, sometimes it'll crust again. Um, and then you also get shiny bumps or nodules like you can see in the slide that shows the uh, eyebrow there of, of that person. So it, it kind of doesn't look lesion. It's just kind of like a shiny bump or sometimes it'll be pearly as you can see on the uh, inner eye one where it's uh, up into the uh, portion there by the nose that's kind of just a shiny bump. Um, same as the last one there on the forehead, you know, just kind of like a uh, ladies, like you kind of burned yourself with the curling iron, <laughs> you know, so that's kind of what it looks like there. Um, but they're all signs and all of those are basal cell carcinomas that are on the slide. So um, sometimes it doesn't look like you expect it to look, which is why, you know, it's important to see the dermatologist for them to determine, you know, if it's suspicious or not suspicious. Um, because sometimes it can look like waxy, like that one in the forehead there on that patient, like waxy or or yellowy. It doesn't really have like a, a lumpy lesiony type like the one um, above it there to the right, uh, that kind of looks like a mole. Um, uh, so you have to make sure that you're getting those things checked out. Now, the other kind is the squamous cell carcinoma, which makes up about 20%, um, about 200,000 uh, plus cases a year. Uh, and with that, uh, once again, when you look at it, it Obviously, there's something different and wrong about that, but, you know, you don't necessarily like the, the one on the ear there that's on the tip of the ear kind of looks like it could be a wart, you know, or some other type of lesion. But, um, you know, some people's minds might not go immediately to a skin cancer issue. So uh, important, once again, to um, see the dermatologist or they'll have the rolled borders like uh, the other one next to it, you know, where it kind of looks like... Um, uh, and, and I mentioned this when I was speaking before, it's like a pizza, you know, so you get that rolled crust, that little thicker on the crust and then it kind of divots in. But I said, you know, after talking like that, I was like, you know, you, people will never be able to look at pizza the same way. Uh, so, uh, but if you see it and it's like that with that rolled kind of border and dipping in, um, that's a sign that, you know, there, there could be an issue with it. So um, with the squamous cell carcinoma, there's less of it. But um, it, it can be present for a very long time if nothing's done about it. It can actually penetrate into the underlying tissue if it doesn't get treated and can be disfiguring. So, uh, and then you see there the one on the lip um, with that um, lesion there. Again, some people may think it's something else because of the way it looks and because it's on the lip, but you can't get them anywhere. It's still a cutaneous area. So anytime you get anything that is uh, asymmetrical, so it's not a perfect little circle or the borders, uh, you know, so the borders are irregular, it's changing color, it's enlarging, you know, so they go through those A, B, C, Ds, and they added E's for evolving, meaning it's just changing. Um, you should definitely make sure you get it checked out. All right, so now let's get to um, some Moe's stuff. <laughs> Lady says, oh boy, it will force me to be away from pizza. So 
<laughs> yeah, I guess that could be a good uh, uh, thing if you're looking to um, uh, kind of watch your pizza eating is to th think of uh, skin cancer when you, when you look at it. Um, but no. Uh, so with the Mo's, uh, interestingly, you know, the the man that was behind designing Mo's micrographic surgery, his name was uh, Frederick Edward Mo. And when he came about the idea, it was back in 1933. And at the time, he was only 23 years old. So uh, I think it's pretty amazing that, you know, he had the, the mind to come up with these kind of things. And at the time, he wasn't a physician yet. He was a research assistant and he was assigned to inject chemicals into cancerous rat tissue to produce specific reactions so they could kind of, you know, do research. And he discovered that one of the chemicals, uh, it was a zinc chloride solution, um, that that could fix the skin tissue for microscopic study. And it would preserve it without changing the structure of the cells. So they'd still be able to study it. Um, so he combined that zinc fluoride solution with some other things to develop like a paste. And then when he applied the paste, he found that he could excise the tissue without causing bleeding. So then he could prepare the frozen sections of the tissue and then place them on slides to be looked at under the microscope. So that's what kind of like began the whole Mohs micrographic, you know, search. So then in 1936, when he was a physician and, and trained as a surgeon, he began to perform the procedure. And, and this is why originally they called it chemo surgery because of the zinc chloride paste. So if you hear some physicians refer to it as chemo surgery, surgery. That's why. That's what they used to call Mo surgery. Um, so he started performing it on humans. So uh, back then, though, it could take days to do. It's not like today. Now, today it's still a long process, but not anything like it was back then. Because back then, uh, once they revealed a patient had a cancer, then he would put on the acid to the area that was in, that, that thought it was involved. And that would allow them to, to scrape away the protein keratin in that epidermal layer so that the paste then could penetrate into the area. They'd apply the paste and so it would fixate the tissue and then they'd put a dressing over it and then try to enhance, you know, the absorption of the paste. So when they got adequate fixation, uh, sometimes it would be hours later, sometimes it would be the next day, you know, then he would remove the dressing and then use a scalpel, surgically excise a saucer shape uh, layer of the fixed tissue. And then he'd cut it into specimens and then um, sketch it. So this is where the mapping came from. So he'd sketch it on a map because when you do MOS, they will, they will get their layer, they will cut it, they will stain it. Because once you start to look at it under the microscope, it's hard because now it's just tissue to see, oh, well, was that the upper right corner? Was it the lower left corner? You know, so they do color coding of it so that you can tell when you're looking at it exactly what you're looking for. So if there are still malignant cells there that they know where to go and cut more skin. So it's not just keeping making a bigger and bigger circle. You can do it with much more precision. So it makes it to where there is less um, uh, tissue loss. So it's, it's a very skin sparing procedure. So, um, and Mo came up with this. So he painted the adjoining edges, different dyes to differentiate the superior edges from the inferior edges. And then he would mark them you know, one, two, three, four, and right and left and things like that to show where each color-coded section originated. And he would make his map to match what he had done with his color coding. And then that way, as I said, if there are further layers that have to be done, further stages, you know which way to move. You know, do you need to move right on the skin or left? Or do you need to go a little deeper? So um, uh, it makes it much more precise. So then they take those frozen sections and prepare them and they mount them on the slides and they examine them under the microscope. So uh, once again, they label the slides to indicate the position that matches the map. So if there was no evidence of cancer, they were done. But if there was, then the surgery would continue to the 
corresponding site to where they would know, then they would reapply it and then they would have to repeat the whole thing over again. So once again, it could be another day before they could come back in and have the rest of it done. So uh, in 1953, though, he tried this, this fresh tissue version, and that's how we have, are, are using it today now. So we don't have to do the whole wait a whole day and come back and start doing it. Um, you know, and he did it because it was a patient that had um, uh, a lesion that was on her eyelid. She had a BCC on her eyelid, and he was trying not to irritate you know, the globe of the eye with the, using the chemicals and all that kind of stuff with that paste. Um, so he used local anesthesia and then, you know, he just excised the layer of tissue and then made his map and froze it and started to do all that. And that's evolved into how we do it today or how it's done today. And this is a picture of Dr. Mo. If you look at the picture uh, from right to left, uh, on right is another physician, Dr. Perry Robbins. The next one, the gentleman with the tie and no jacket on is Dr. Mo, Dr. Frederick Mo. And then there's another physician, Dr. Koff, and then Leona Mandel, and then Dr. Brown. So these are um, the first Mo's team that was at NYU. So I just thought it was kind of neat to, to see the gentleman who came up with it. So now from a um, coding background, uh, coding guidelines, you know, when we take a look at um, um, reporting MOS, you know, in CPT, they give us that um, with MOS micrographic surgery, that it is a technique for removal of complex, ill-defined cancers. Um, what I highlighted here, and for some reason on the slide, it looked like I, it went highlight happy. Um, I didn't have all that highlighted, so I don't know how that happened in, in getting it put over here. So what I highlighted was what's underlined there is surgeon and pathologist. The important thing to remember, in order to report MOS, the surgeon has to act as surgeon and pathologist. So he or she has to do both portions. If they farm out, like they have that term of slow mows where they say they're doing mows, but they send the pathology out to be looked at. Well, technically, then that's not considered mows by CPT standards. So um, slow mows is not coded as mows. Um, and uh, but they have to act as both in order for it to be done that way. And then also with the uh, removals of the tissue, it talks about in uh, the CPT guidelines about this tissue block because you code it by stage and by block. So they're saying that the tissue block then is the individual tissue piece that's embedded in the mounting medium. So after they section it off and put it on the mounting medium, that slide, that is the block that they then put through the Mohs micrographic machine, which you'll see in the video. So also they talk about repairs. So repairs that are done because of MOS, if you are doing flaps and grafts, things like that, those are separately reportable from the MOS micrographic surgery. If you're doing, sometimes though, they leave them open for secondary closing. So they leave them open to secondary intention sometimes is what the note will say. That means that they're letting it close on its own. Well, obviously then there's no repair. Um, if there are um, other uh, uh, simple comp uh, intermediate closures, those kinds of things, uh, you know, those, the separate repairs, flaps and grafts are reported with additional coding. So also if you're doing biopsies, depending on why you're doing them, um, biopsies are going to show as bundled in the NCCI edits because they're saying, you know, the biopsy is part of the Mohs procedure um, just like the pathology, the 88,000 code is part of the Mohs procedure. But sometimes there are cases where the patient has a biopsy because the Mohs surgeon biopsies the area and then does the pathology on it, says, yes, you know, this is a basal cell and you're a good candidate. Do you want Mohs? Yes, we want Mohs. And you do Mohs right then. Then that biopsy and pathology are separately reportable, and you would use modifier 59 on them to show, you know, this wasn't part of the Mohs procedure. This was what I did to define that I needed to do a Mohs procedure. So um, it, it just, uh, depending on what's going on, watch for those additional things that can be reported. 
Now, what I did on this slide is I kind of color coded it to try to show differentiation in what you're looking for in the CPT codes. Because as you can see, there's not a bunch of CPT codes for most. We've got five codes. So in looking at it, what I put in blue is the location. So 17311 and 12 are for the head, neck, hands, feet, genitalia, and any locations where surgery directly involves muscle, cartilage, bone, tendon, major nerves, or vessels. And then 17314 uh, and 13 and 4 are for trunk, arms, and legs. And then 17315, you notice it doesn't have blue because site is not a, a driver for that add-on code. So um, we'll see what it is in a second here. So um, 311 and 12 are together. 17313 and 14 are together. So then the next thing is in green, and that's the stage. So if it's the first stage, the first cut that they're making, then you're using 17311. If it's a first stage, you also may use 17313 if it's in that other site. So those two codes are the first stages. And then 17312 and 17314 are for each additional stage after the first stage. And then uh, 17315, the add-on code is for any stage. Uh, then we look at the red, and that is the tissue block issue. So 17311, 12, 13, and 14 are for up to five tissue blocks. And then 17315 is each additional block after five, any stage. So once you go over five blocks in a stage, you start to use the add-on code, no matter where it's done, no matter what stage it is. Um, so you kind of, I kind of just kind of um, tried to make a little color coding out of it. Also, I made another slide here that shows it broken down in a different way, like a graph. So you could look at it and say, all right, if it's the head, neck, hands, feet, you know, I'm looking at one, one and one, two. Uh, and then you go over to the next one. And it shows what stage it is. And then the blocks are the next thing. So I kind of just made it in a different way because, you know, everybody takes different information in different ways where it kind of just hits them a little bit better. So um, I tried to put it in here in a couple different ways um, because I know everybody doesn't always catch it in a certain way. And sometimes it may be the way I'm putting it across. Sometimes it may be because of the way you receive it. You know, so I like to try to mix it up a little bit to make it a little bit better and easier for everybody to kind of, you know, have the light bulb go off. So those are just two different ways that I put them out there for you. So from a CPT standard, uh, uh, standing, what you're looking at from um, properly coding MOS is verify that the MOS surgeon did both the surgery and the pathology. That's the first thing. Remember, if they don't do both, not MOS. Um, look at the location, then the stages, then the blocks, then the number of lesions, because each one should be coded separately, and then what those separately reportable services may be. Like we said, we were talking about the, um, you may be able to build biopsy and a pathology separately. Um, there are some special stains that can be done that may be able to be reported spe uh, separately. So be looking for those separately reported procedures with that. And then the last thing um, I think in here, or we'll come back to the video, is uh, watching your NCDs and LCDs and things like that and, and private payor uh, issues that come out talking about MOS. Uh, I, I put a couple LCDs on this slide that show um, uh, different ones that are currently out there from different Macs that address different different issues that they see with MOS, which I thought was kind of interesting that, you know, they're, they're picking up and picking on, you know, like different kind of things. So for instance, LCD L33689, and you can look these LCDs up by Googling and just put the LCD actually in the Google search. So you can just put in LCD L33689 and hit you know, search and it should bring the LCD up for you. Um, this one talks about coverage indications, limitations, and physician qualifications that they expect to see for doing MOS and when they will cover MOS procedures. And then we have LCD 
L35702, which then addresses the state's usage of appropriate use criteria, or the, it states the usage of that AUC. Remember, I was showing you the AUC a little bit ago. So in this LCD, they give you what they expect to see for that AUC on the documentation. So that's kind of tells you that they want to see it because not all physicians and not all most surgeons use that. So if you're in where this LCD may cover, that's something that you want to make sure that you're putting into your documentation in case your documentation were to get reviewed from payor. Um, LCD L33436 addresses modifier 59 usage. Um, with doing those separately reportable biopsies and path readings that I was talking about. And then I put a couple more on here. So um, something to take a look at if y'all do MOS is to make sure that you're looking at the LCDs that are affecting where you're at. Or if you're a billing service and you have clients in different states, make sure you know, you're looking at the ones for that or um, you're a coder that codes for different areas in the country, once again, so whatever applies to you, an auditor, if you audit records like this, make sure that's something that you know whether or not you have to see the AUC on the documentation, um, or if that's something you wanna point out to the physicians um, when you're auditing is that, hey, you know, according to your LCD, this information is necessary and I'm not seeing it. And also, it just kind of gives you that other uh, other tools that you can use to kind of help um, bring forward, you know, what you're doing and educating the physicians and and on what they need to be doing, and especially the most surgeons on what you need to be seeing in the documentation to support these procedures, because these are are um, kind of one of the bigger, biggest, uh, you know, RVU type of things that in dermatology we do. So you want to make sure that if you have most surgeons that are doing these procedures, that you know they're they're having everything in there so that they can keep all the payments that they're getting for these things and that they rightfully deserve. So remember when you are uh, reporting the most procedures, you're looking to verify. They're both surgeon and pathologist. You're verifying the location, the number of stages. So these are the things in the documentation you're looking for that if there's a biopsy, with the MOS that it's separately reportable, that you're using modifier 59 on it, um, report your special stains separately uh, from an ICD-10 standpoint, specificity, right? Make sure that the MOS site is matching to the ICD-10 code for where you're saying the site of the skin cancer is, um, you know, because if those things don't match, obviously it's gonna get kicked back because it doesn't make sense then. Um, with uh, also uh, remember that some of those in the skin cancer thing do have laterality to them. So don't code out of just the table. I know everybody says all of that stuff when we, we were like done it to death with ICD-9. But sometimes it was funny because you I mean, I, I couldn't remember sometimes what a code was in ICD-9. But then I'd look in the index and the alpha index. and I go, Oh, that that's and it just kind of brought it back to me. And I knew that was right. And of course, I didn't go double check it in the back because I knew, you know, but now with um, ICD-10, because there's 60 some thousand codes, you know, we can't do that anymore. And when you look in the neoplasm table, it's not always complete codes in there because there's laterality to them. So you have to go to the back to make sure that you're pulling the full complete code. So, you know, make sure you're doing the right, you know, doing the right thing by double checking them in the back. And then two, they break down by, you know, the type. So is the basal cell, is the squamous cell, um, carcinoma in situ, two, um, things like that. Now, melanomas, um, notice I didn't really talk about melanomas a lot. Um, and that's because melanomas, they don't really do a lot of most for melanomas. Right now, they're kind of researching it to see if it is also just as good for melanoma as it is for basal and squamous cell carcinoma. Because with the um, basal and squamous cell carcinomas, it's like 99, 95% effective in eradicating cancer and it's done and it's gone. Um, so that's just like fabulous. So they're now studying with melanoma if it does have those same great rates. So 
them. It's not always done with melanoma in, in, in a lot of areas. So that's kind of emerging something to keep our eye on. But um, if they do come out in, in that way and it's got stronger evidence and they start using it, then, you know, we may see something different in codes or, or shifting in, you know, the LCDs, of course, with the medical necessity and the um, you know, acceptable codes may change and things like that. So it's something just to keep your eye on. But for now, melanoma has not done a lot for Mohs micrographic surgery. And then I just made a little case here um, to show. So in the case, we have a, a patient that comes with a lesion on her nose and area H. Um, and then it's irregular shape and it's growing. Physician does a tangential biopsy. So at this visit, we would bill out the 11102 for the tangential biopsy. And our ICD-10 code would be D49.2 for a neoplasm of unspecified nature. I, I don't know what this is, right? So um, then the um, comes back positive. So they come in for Mohs. So here is a little Mohs uh, um, contracted note down. So they prevent for Mohs suite for the procedure. They see the patient. They go over the procedure. Um, the biopsy uh, photograph is reviewed. Uh, the location, uh, the pre-op diagnosis, the post-op diagnosis. So it's it's you know a regular procedure note. Um, they do the local infiltration, and then it, the note states that the surgeon and pathologist is Dr. Morgan. So that's denoting that the physician is doing both jobs that they need to do in order to report this as Mohs. And then uh, you look at the indications. It talks about the tumor located on the left superior nose and that it's in the uh, high area, area H. Um, and that these are um, more uh, susceptible to um, spreading and invasion and things like that. And it's poorly defined and it's suspected to be deep tissue invasion. So it was prepped and draped and now they're going in to do the procedure. And as you can see from looking at it, um, that we are... Um, uh, making the initial incision, they do it through the skin, then it's taken to the lab, divided into the pieces, it's chroma-coded and processed according to Mohs protocol. Uh, so then it was repeated in successive stages until the tumor-free defect was achieved. Um, totaling was the two, uh, two stages that were required. So this is kind of a little condensed note. You also will want to see, uh, sometimes I will look for, and you want to see the map. So always look for the map because you'll need to have the map with the uh, most to show what is done and how they did it. And so if you use an EMR, you know, some, what I see a lot of my clients, um, ones that are on Emma, Emma's a uh, system that a lot of dermatologists use. So they will do the map and then they scan it and they put it into Emma. So that way, if a uh, payor requests a Mohs surgery, that you'll also want to make sure you print those maps out and send them along with. And then uh, the coding for that would be 17311 because it was in area H, it was on the nose, it was in our high area. So um, it fits in that area. And then we did a second stage, so we would do 17312 also. And at this point, our ICD-10 code is C44.311 to show that it was a basal cell of the nose. And then here are the resources that I was using so that you can see them. Um, that uh, uh, if you want to look at those LCDs and the history that I gave you on Dr. Mo, um, you can go and take a look at that. So uh, you can go look at those resources anytime if you are wanting to uh, check out more on Mo's. All right. So let me take the slides down. And now I am going to share um, the Mo's surgical video. So it's not real like icky, bloody, anything like that. 
um, because it is, you know, they inject the lidocaine, they're just taking the, the little layer and actually the surgeon's hand covers up a lot of the view. So it, it might not even be for some of y'all um, as invasive as you would like to see, but I think it's good and it's a good indicator and shows what goes on and they cut out the time because what happens after they cut it out and they prepare it and they put it through the most micrographic machine. The micrographic machine takes a while to process the specimens. So they'll do a layer, they fix it. The, the uh, most tech does everything they need to do with it. They put it into the micrographic machine and the patient goes back and sits in the waiting room. And then once it goes through and then they check it, if it's still showing that there's some cancer cells, then they come back to the operating suite then they do it again. And then so there sometimes can be some back and forth, depending on how large your Mohs micrographic suite is. So this one is, I think it's like four minutes. No, it's a, I'm sorry, it's 10 minutes, but it's kind of condensed down from what a normal Mohs procedure takes. But it's just to show you the steps. So let me share that screen. And that is in this oval of purple polka dots um, right here. And we have the patient verify that we can hear. We've gone over all the risks and benefits, alternative treatments. And now um, we've gotten her permission. We're going to go ahead and dump her up with the um, lidocaine. She's going to feel poked in a room with the BC. It's not pleasant, but it's short lived and it's highly effective. And here we go. One, two, after going through all that. No. Absolutely, I don't blame you. Everyone wants to know, how do you know how far to go and how deep to go? And this is one of our first landmarks. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Good. And then we make our incision just about one to two millimeters right around um, the lesion and right around what we see right here. Little hashtags because we need to have orientation as to what's up, what's down, what's right, and what's left. These little hashtags help us orient to you to come back for a second stage of love. We just remove that final piece with our eyeless scissors, keeping it in orientation. So I'm holding on to her left half that we put there. Okay. And we transfer that onto our transfer card that keeps our orientation picture of the nose right there as it was on the patient. Yeah. Next we use cautery, which is a little electric current to seal over the blood vessels. So they're just cauterizing her nose there, they're cauterizing the wound. Okay. 
You know, the patient will get a bandage and then go to the waiting room to wait. We come over here and start the processing of the tissue. This is our map. We have labeled A1 and A2. We're going to cut this um, tissue in half so that we have an A1 and an A2 specimen. So we make an incision there, um, connecting those two hashes that we put on the patient. Put a few relaxing cuts into the tissue just so that um, when it goes to my histotech, it will process the tissue and make glass slides. It um, lays down nicely for her and uh, allows us to see 100% of that margin. Now the other thing that we need to do is we color code our pieces so we know what's right and what's left. So um, I need to know what's the right side of my A1 and what's the left side of my A2. So we color code. The half is blue and the other half is red so that I know that when I'm looking at it under the microscope. We then ink the tissue so that it corresponds to that map and to those maps colors. I hope not. He's not here. So once again, we've got the blue and the yellow on A2. We've got the red and the blue on A1. We then put this into a little um, container that we're going to take to the lab. We orient them in a certain way with A1 always being in the top left corner and then A2 after that. Now the tissue is ready to take to the lab. The patient will go to the waiting room and we'll take this to the lab. We set this here and then the histotech is going to take the tissue and she's going to process it in what's called a cryostat, which is right here. I am putting the tissue with a certain orientation so that when she looks at it microscopically, she can see it as closely to how it was in the body. So I'm just trying to get everything as carefully lined up as I can. And then we will freeze it. Sectioning. And each section is roughly two cell layers thick. And I will take sections at different intervals throughout the tissue so that she can have a complete picture of those sections. And check the sections microscopically before I stain them to make certain that I have the complete skin edge and then load them on the stainer and wait for them to process. This is the map that we have um, from our patient with the squamous cell carcinoma in situ on the nose and um, we had section A1 and, and A2. The slide was made of this and we have now got section um, A1 and A2. Um, with this being um, going in order uh, from most superficial to deepest on the patient. If you look at this under the microscope, this is the most important portion of the Mohs surgery um, because examining the tissue and making sure that all of the cancer cells are gone um, is the, really the strength of the Mohs surgery. And so this is the most important portion. So right now I'm looking at section A1 under the microscope. And I know that because I'm seeing the blue half and the red half and knowing exactly where I'm at. The tissue here looks very healthy. Now I'm looking at section A2 under the microscope. And kind of I scan first the edges and then I look at the base. I can see that the precancer portion is just kind of right here in this area uh, under the microscope. I'm going to label that as an AK. We'll treat that with a little liquid nitrogen of cryotherapy, but she. Um, is actually clear of her cancer the first time around. And about 50% of the time we did get that clear the first time around. But we don't want you to. Okay. All right. 
So um, the last part of the video is them doing a repair. And as I'm closing in on my time here, um, it, it went on for a little bit more. Um, but that was the, uh, you know, basic Mohs procedure that they were showing you. So uh, that big machine she put it in was the Mohs micrographic machine. Um, they're very, very, very expensive. A lot of places will have um, one or two of those and they have the suite. So they'll have different rooms. And that's why when the patients are done with getting the, you know, their stage done, they go out into the waiting room and then they can bring another patient back so they can have multiple patients having most done at the same time um, because they're at different stages of waiting. So it's kind of neat. So um, I hope that you found the video helpful. I always, like I said, I always think it's really good um, to be able to see all those kind of things and, and get a better understanding of what the, the, the surgeons and the physicians and, and uh, NPPs are doing when they're doing these things. So um, I found that one wasn't really gory. And, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's, you know, I just can't watch it. That one wasn't really that bad. So, um, you know, I, I hope that that helped. And uh, looking at the comments I'm seeing here, um, Oh, um, uh, a LinkedIn user and looking on LinkedIn, that is, oh, Sonal. Hi, Sonal. Um, she says that um, I made an excellent leadership point when I was talking about um, showing things in different ways is that, um, you know, everybody receives information differently. So mixing things up, like you stated, will help everyone better understand. So I appreciate that comment um, because I really do try hard to, you know, make sure everybody's kind of getting the different points I'm putting out there. Um, and oh, Lisa, thank you. Lisa says that she thought the video was great. I'm glad. And Guadalupe is, is me. Yeah, that that uh, uh, there are some pretty strong smells with those things when they're going on. So, um, yes, you're 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 correct in that, too. But, um, you know, when they're doing the most, you'll you'll see that they've got the the most texts and things and, and they do very, very important jobs and very intense jobs as they're trying to section like you heard her talking about how thin and you saw how wafer thin that those um, specimens were that the machine was cutting for them to look to make sure that they're getting all the cancer and that they've got everything. Um, oh, thank you, lady. I, I really appreciate that lady. Lady um, made a comment that I'm, I always provide great info. So I really try. So um, I hope that y'all enjoyed this and uh, glad that you could make it here with me on short notice. Um, since I just put this up yesterday, I appreciate the those of y'all that get, could find the time and make time to, to spend um, an hour with me today looking at this stuff. Um, it, when you uh, have any ideas, oh, if you have any ideas for future healthcare happenings topics, if you want to just message me on LinkedIn, I, I um, am more than happy to look at that. And, um, you know, I always try to get interesting guests on. I hope those of y'all that couldn't make it for our networking session, um, which was the last session I did, uh, look for it on YouTube when it goes up. Or you can watch the recording on LinkedIn if you look back through your LinkedIn stuff and see that session. That session was so much fun. It was really great. And we had a lot of great people on it as panelists. So, um, uh, oh, and Pam is making a good a good comment here. So I just wanted to show it. Uh, I'm glad you thought it was fun, but she says she didn't realize how much work is going into these procedures. Exactly. And that's why I love showing this. So uh, I appreciate that comment too, because that's, that's, you know, the point I'm trying to get across for people is to, you know, understand. And this is why we want to fight to make sure that, that, that our physicians and other providers are getting paid right. You know, it's because we see these kinds of things and understand what's going into it. So you want to make sure that they get out of it what they're supposed to and that they can continue doing those kind of procedures for people. I mean, most micrographic suites are multi-million dollar projects when they put these things together. So, you know, in order for them to be doing these wonderful things for patients, you know, we need to be paid appropriately for what's being done so we can continue offering it. Um, so uh, I really appreciate everybody joining me today. Um, 
And yes, Guadalupe, I hope I don't get any more tornadoes either. Uh, and um, who was it? Uh, Lisa, Lisa uh, Chavez Miller. If you want to just uh, send me a message on LinkedIn, um, I will be happy to discuss uh, speaking for your chapter. Um, yeah, I, I uh, try to speak to as many chapters as I can when they have something they would like for me to put up for them. So uh, I have a schedule of, you know, how many I, I you know can get to at a time period. So um, if you want to just send me a message, we can look and see, you know, uh, if I can get uh, on your schedule, if it works somewhere for me. But I'd be happy to speak to your chapter. Uh, and Pam, you're quite welcome. And everybody, again, thank you very much. And I hope you'll uh, join me next time and uh, tell other people, you know, they can follow me on LinkedIn so they can get notices when I have my broadcast coming up to see what I am going to be speaking about uh, that week. And I'm not real sure next session what I'm going to do yet. So, uh, but you'll see a notice from me probably next week coming up. So thanks a lot, y'all. Enjoy the rest of your week and take care.